Uh, so this is from Seize the Time by Bobby Seale, and I selected this passage because even though I think that gun and firearm activism uh, isn't always that necessary, it's not really something I do, you know, some other people do it, but I think that this was a very good example of firearm activism that occurred, especially considering the position the Black Panthers were in at the time. Um, so this is from uh, an excerpt from May 1967. One, mor one Monday morning, Huey called me up and said, Bobby, come on over to the house right quick. I went over to the house. Huey showed me the papers. He said, look here, Mulford is up in the legislature now trying to get a bill passed against us. We don't care about laws anyways, because the laws they make don't serve us at all. He's probably making a law that served the power structure. He's probably trying to get some kind of law passed against us. He said, I've been thinking. Remember when I told you that we have to go in front of a city hall, in front of a jail, or do something like we did in Martinez to get more publicity so we can get a message over to the people? This was Huey's chief concern, getting a message over to the people. So Huey says, you know what we're going to do? What? We're going to the Capitol, I said. The Capitol, he said. Yeah, we're going to the Capitol. I say, for what? Mulford's there, and they're trying to pass a law against our guns. And we've, we're going to the Capitol steps. We're going to take the best Panthers we've got, and we're going to the Capitol steps with our guns and forces loaded down to the gills. Hey, Derek. And we're going to read a message to the world, because all the press is going Derek to be up there. The press is always up there. They'll listen to the message, and they'll probably blast it off all across this country. I know. I know they'll blast it all the way across California. We've got to get a message over to the people. Huey understood a revolutionary culture, and Huey understood how arms and guns became a part of the culture of a people in the revolutionary struggle. And he knew that the best way to do this was to go forth, and those hungry newspaper reporters who were shocked, who were all going to be shook up, who were going to be blasting that news faster than could be stopped. I said, all right, brother, right on, I'm with you, we're going to the Capitol. So we called a meeting that night, before going to the Capitol, to write the first executive mandate for the Black Panther Party. Huey was going to write executive mandate number one. This executive mandate was the first major message to all the American people, and all the black people in particular, in this country, who are living in the confines of this decadent system. Eldridge and Huey and all of us sat down, and it didn't take long. We weren't jiving. No time at all. Not like some of the intellectuals and punks that have to take ten days before they can write an executive mandate to put things together. I don't think it was 15 minutes before we whipped that executive mandate out, looked it over, and Eldridge corrected it, got things together. The executive mandate was the first message, the first Mazer message made by the Black Panther Party, coming from the Minister of Defense, Huey P. Newton. Huey told me to organize the brothers, tell them to get their guns, and be at the office tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. We're going to leave at 10 o'clock. We're going to leave at 10 o'clock sharp. On May 2nd, 1967, we went across the bridge to Sacramento with a caravan of cars. We wound up right in front of the Capitol building. There were 30 brothers and sisters, 6 sisters and 24 brothers. 20 of the brothers were armed. Huey P. Newton was not with us. The brothers felt we could not risk Huey getting shot or anything, so we voted that he would stay behind in Oakland. We voted Huey down and wouldn't let him come. When I first drove up, I didn't know where the steps were. The Capitol looked about a block or so away from me. I didn't know whether this was the right place or not because we were specifically looking for an assembly of the state of California. The dome, a round dome, was supposed to be an omnipotent area, as Brother Eldridge Cleaver put it. It's the top, and it was supposed to be made up of two houses. So I assumed it would be the same as Washington, D.C. I didn't know there was going to be a right place or not, but I said, look, there's a, some cameramen up there. Huey said there's always cameramen around these places, so I thought, this is probably it. The other brothers had parked their cars and come back around to where we were. We got out of the car and got our guns out. You know we were always following the laws. As soon as the brothers got out of the cars, they were putting rounds into the chambers, because Huey and I researched those laws in the past. Would you hold for a moment and answer one question? Does Rich Paul's bail money, uh, has that I come have in? It. Okay, are we able to take it to the jail at some point? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, today or tomorrow? What do you think? I'm, I'm on the phone with the them. jail's open today, then I guess. Yeah, if, yeah. if you guys go, can I go too? So I guess. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do that thing. Um, sign up for Securus. Do that on the internet. No, I don't know that. Oh, that'd be. Alright, so, um, we had to follow the law to the letter. There was a fish and game code of law that you couldn't have a loaded shotgun or rifle in a car. That didn't refer to a pistol, but to a shotgun or rifle. 
A lot of people were looking. A lot of white people were shocked just looking at us. I know what they were saying. Who the hell are these niggers with these guns? Who are the hell are these people? Uh, what are they doing? One or two white people, they probably passed us off as, oh, this is just a gun club. This is where Bob Dylan gets down on Mr. Jones. You don't know what's going on. Because this was getting to be a colossal event and those people did not know what the hell was going on. Some of them did look at us like we were a gun club. A lot of them only had questions on their faces. What the hell are they doing with all these goddamn rifles? They actually stopped and looked at us and stood there around the Capitol and stared up from the grass and looked at us. I didn't pay a damn bit of attention to them because we knew our constitutional rights and all that stuff about the right citizens to have to guns. The Second Amendment of the Constitution of the United States and no police or military force can infringe upon that right. It states that specifically. All the brothers got up and I said, all right, let's roll. We started walking and moving. We didn't walk in military form. We just moved. We were scattered all across the sidewalk. We were not in any rank, but we held our guns straight up because Huey taught us not to point a gun at anyone. Not only was it unsafe, but there was also a law against the pointing of a gun. So all the brothers had that stuff down. They had their guns pointed straight up in the air or pointed straight down on the ground as they carried them. We were walking up the sidewalk and I remember a brother in the background saying, look at Reagan, run. I thought he was just referring to something symbolic, but I did found out later on, after all this was over, that Ronald Reagan was there with a bunch of kids. We walked up almost a 20 foot wide sidewalk leading up to the first steps of the Capitol, and one of the dudes says, look at Reagan run. Now this is important because we found out later that Reagan had with him 200 future youth leaders, they call them. He was speaking to them on the lawn of the Capitol. I was looking straight up at the front of the Capitol building and I saw a couple of cameramen running around up there. I found out later that Reagan had righteously spotted us. One of the brothers saw him turn around and start trotting away from the whole scene because here came these hard-faced brothers. These brothers were off the block. Righteous brothers off the block. What you would call the nitty-gritty and the gra grassroots. You could look at their faces and see the turmoil they've lived through. Their ages ranged anywhere from 16, which was about the youngest we had there, Bobby Hutton, all the way down to myself, 31. I guess I was about the oldest. We walked up the steps, and we walked on to the next stairs. Bobby Hutton was on my right side, Warren Tucker on my left side. Bobby had a 12-gauge shotgun, a high-standard 12-gauge pump, and Warren Tucker had a 357 Magnum. We walked all the way up and stayed right next to me. We got to the stairs. Now, personally, I do not remember reading executive mandate number one on the stairs, as I was ordered to do so. I don't remember it, but the brothers told me I did, and everybody told me I did afterwards. Alright, so it's pretty long, but they end up going inside, reading it again. The cops take their guns, give them back. Um, they read it again, and it gets all sorts of media attention. And then when they leave, they get arrested at a gas station, and a bunch of cop cars pull up and arrest them for having concealed weapons. So they waited for them to put all the weapons in the well, that's where they got the name from, from the dots from. Mm -hmm. Oh, for Huey. Yeah, yeah, Huey they Freeman's definitely Huey. Well, thinking about it, he was just talking a bunch of shit. Mm-hmm. And he's smart, and they didn't want to come with him. They waited for them to put the guns in the car first so they can hit them with concealment. I'm fucking believing. Yeah, that's, I guess it's similar to the New Hampshire law. It's like in, a, in a car, it's concealed. Well, I think they said it didn't apply to pistols, but some people did have rifles and shotguns. They waited. If you drive, you feel pressured if with you drive Eric a car, <laughs> I wonder if you can get away with that, with driving a car with a rifle on a roof rack because it's open carry. <laughs> it's not concealed. Um, I wonder if anybody's tried that. Well, I think they may, unless the rifle is pointed up. If it's, I can't think of like a direction it could be pointed horizontally that couldn't be a potential threat to someone. So you'd almost have to have the rifle like pointed up at the in the air. Once you get into a car, it's, it's considered roof. concealed. It doesn't even matter if it's if you would put it in your pocket or what. If it's in the car, it's concealed. That's how Rich got busted. Well, Mark took the ball for it, but that's how Rich got busted out this. Fucking waited. Oh, freaking scumbags even back then.
Well, in Mass, just having the gun was completely illegal, too. It just having ammo in Mass is illegal. Yeah. Uh, taking a dump on Sunday between the hours of 3 and 5 is probably illegal in Mass. That's got way too many laws. I will never call Actually, one there is a law, and I can't remember if it's New Hampshire or Mass, that you cannot look up while going to the bathroom on Sunday. You cannot look towards the heavens while going to the bathroom on Sunday. Wow. we got to get that one enforced. Don't give them any more ideas. Yeah, I will. I will I, Benny Coplock already asked, asked me to do a, a meetup. Yeah, I won't do Mass. I will not fucking touch that state. Why? I will do activism and nothing. It's just too many laws. A cop let me go in mass, um, but apparently what I was doing was a felony. I had just got back from the BDSM club, and I didn't put away some of my gear, and I had a ball gag sitting with Brooke here next to me, and they told me bond your gear in any form in Massachusetts is illegal. Like, any. Yeah, you cannot be riding into mass in bond gear. Okay. Wow, well, anything there. Nope. No bondage gear because you can get you can get a rape charge for bondage gear in mass. Every everything's against the law of that. Which is great because you should see the goth club in Haven. 